optimum pH, optimum temperature, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, good questions. Yes? Does your substrate affect that as well? Well, the concentration of the substrate certainly does. Right. And certain types of substrates will. So chymotrypsin is a good example. Chymotrypsin will work on a variety of different substrates. So depending upon the substrate I give it, some it likes better than others. Uh, most enzymes don't do that, though. Most enzymes really prefer one substrate, and that's it. Chymotrypsin is a little unusual in that respect. Okay. Okay. Now, look at the shape of this curve. Have you seen the shape of this curve anywhere in class before today? Where do we see a shape of curve like this? There's your pop quiz. Oh, yeah, it's there somewhere. Anybody, where'd you see it? Biology. <laughs> Did we do biology in here? Myoglobin, right? Didn't remember the binding curve for myoglobin when we saw it made it went up, it just went up and then it went over like that? That's a hyperbolic curve that myoglobin had. And what property did myoglobin have compared to hemoglobin? In terms of quaternary structure. It had a single subunit, right? Myoglobin had a single subunit. And hemoglobin had four, and we saw cooperativity happening, right? We saw that it had varying amounts of affinity for oxygen as the concentration of oxygen changed, right? Let me show you another enzyme. This is an enzyme that has quaternary structure, OK? Chymotrypsin does not have quaternary structure. This enzyme has quaternary structure. Ooh. Here's the same plot before. Velocity against substrate concentration. Notice it is S-shaped. That S we refer to as sigmoidal. Just like we saw cooperativity happening in, my, in hemoglobin, so too do we see a similar phenomenon that's occurring with enzymes. Hemoglobin is not an enzyme. Remember that. It doesn't catalyze anything. It's just carrying oxygen. It's all it's doing. In enzymes, when we see this differing affinity that looks like this, what we discover is that it has a property we would call allosterism. The song I sang to you last time talked about allosterism. Allosterism is kind of like cooperativity. The amount of substrate is going to affect the rate with which the enzyme works. Yes. Yes, ma'am. A-L-L-O-S-T-E-R-I-S-M. Allosterism. I'm going to give you a definition for it in a second as well. Okay. So allosterism. An, an enzyme that exhibits allosterism is said to be allosteric, okay, an allosteric enzyme. The enzyme that you're looking at is one of the most studied, or the, 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 the plot, is of an enzyme that's one of the most studied enzymes in biochemistry. It's called ATCase. And no, you don't need to know that. Well, actually, maybe it wouldn't be bad to know that. Yeah, let's, let's know that, okay? I changed my mind, okay? Professor's prerogative. I can change my mind. All right. ATCase exhibits allosterism because we see that its reaction rate changes as a function of its substrate concentration. This turns out to be really, really useful because it turns out that there are some things in our body that will turn ATCase off and keep it way down here and other things in our body that will turn ATCase on and put it way up there. So you recognize there's a couple different rates that we could imagine that ATCase has. I'm going to describe that to you now. Okay? ATCase is an interesting enzyme. It is responsible for making a precursor of CTP. What's CTP? Well, you know ATP, right? CTP has cytidine in it. ATCase is an enzyme that's responsible for helping the cell to make CTP. So it's making a precursor of CTP. That, that part isn't that important. Okay? ATCase has on it some sites where several different things combine. The substrate can bind, for example. And the binding of the substrate does change the enzyme as well. 
But there's other things that affect the enzyme's rate. One of those is ATP. ATP, what, is, what does a cell use ATP for? Energy, right? It's the gasoline of the cell, right? This enzyme is responsible for turning on the synthesis of one kind of nucleotide. Why do cells make nucleotides? One of the things is they want to divide. And one of the things it takes to divide is a lot of energy. Now look at this. ATP is turning this enzyme on. If the cell has a lot of ATP, it has a lot of energy. And when it has a lot of energy, it turns on the synthesis of nucleotides so it can go make whoopee. That's what cells are doing, right? Is that a vote in favor or against? <laughs> okay, that's what's going on, all right? It takes a lot of energy because the cells have to make all of those nucleotides. When we go to replicate our DNA, that's a lot of energy, folks. So if the cell has energy, it's telling the enzymes, hey, we've got energy, it's time to have some fun, let us go and make some CTP, and they do. What if, uh-oh, what if the cell says, oh, I'm really ready, it's Saturday night, it's gung-ho time, we're gonna go and we're gonna do this, okay? And this enzyme kicks in and it starts making a bucket load of CTP. More than the cell can use. The cell has just made a mistake. It's just made too much CTP. It's wasted its energy. How about G? How about A? How about T? How about U, right? All of those things matter. It's just made too much CTP. It turns out that this enzyme has a binding site for CTP as well. I'll let you guess what it does. It turns the enzyme off. Now, we start to see how enzymes are controlled. CTP is the final product of the pathway that this enzyme starts. When the final product of a pathway inhibits the first enzyme in the pathway, it's called feedback inhibition. ATCase is inhibited by feedback inhibition. So this keeps the cell from making too much CTP. Okay, we got plenty of CTP. Go make some G, go make some A, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We've got all of these things. Does that make sense? Okay. So anytime you see a sigmoidal plot on a, this, by the way, this plot has a name. I should also give you the name. I haven't done that. This plot's called a V versus S plot. V standing for velocity, S standing for substrate concentration. Whenever you see a sigmoidal curve on a V versus S plot, you're talking about an allosteric enzyme. And whenever you see a hyperbolic plot on a V versus S, you're not talking about an allosteric enzyme. Okay? So chymotrypsin is not an allosteric enzyme because it had a hyperbolic plot to it. It did not have a sigmoidal plot to it. Make sense? Questions about that? Yes? Oh, allosteric, I'm sorry, I didn't do that, I promised. Absent-minded professor, okay? So an allosteric enzyme, or allosterism, let's just call it allosterism, occurs when a small molecule binds to a protein and affects the protein's activity. So allosterism occurs when a small molecule binds to a protein and affects a protein's activity. That effect can be positive, that effect can be negative. It depends on the molecule, and it depends on the protein. We saw in the case of ATCase that ATP activated the protein, CTP inactivated the protein, like an on-off switch. That definition happens to be one of my favorite definitions, just in case you're wondering. Yes, sir? Certainly, feedback inhibition. So feedback, I'll give you the definition first, and I'll give you the example again. So feedback inhibition occurs when the last molecule in a metabolic pathway 
inhibits the first enzyme in the pathway. It turns out this is a very, very efficient way to control things. Let's think about General Motors. Okay? Or Ford. Does anybody prefer Ford over General Motors? We used to, when I was a kid, we used to argue about these sorts of things. You know? Ah, Chevy is better, right? You know? Okay. Let's think about the factory analogy. Okay? General Motors wants to have delivered to its factory the materials that the factory needs to make those cars. If I've got some uh, component that is being produced somewhere, I don't know, let's say in Taiwan, and it has to get shipped all the way across the country, and, or across the ocean and get to get into the country or whatever, or maybe it's being made in Kentucky, I don't, it doesn't really matter. The point is that if it just keeps coming and coming and coming and it's coming faster than I can use it, I'm wasting resources, right? I'm paying people to make things that are, they're making it faster than I can use it. And so what's happening is piling up out here in my garage. I can let it pile up if I want to. But if I do, meanwhile, these people at the other end are wasting all kinds of energy getting stuff to me. Now let's think about the metabolic pathway. The metabolic pathway, we'll talk about them later, but in the metabolic pathway, we have a series of reactions. Reaction one makes a product for number two. Number two makes a product for number three. Number three for number four. Number four, number five. Number five, number six, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In the process of making CTP, there are 10 steps, and they all require a lot of energy. I could stop the pathway at, say, number six, but then I would have wasted all the energy in going from one to six as six started to accumulate. That doesn't make sense. It makes sense to stop the problem at the source. So by stopping the precursor, that is the very first thing from being made, I stop the whole pathway. Make sense? It's also the strategy of a strike. If you want to strike against General Motors, you don't have to stop every component from going to the factory. You only have to stop one. Right? You stop one component from going to the factory, and if it's a door handle, I'm sorry, that car is not going to be done. Right? So stopping that very first thing in a metabolic pathway stops the entire pathway from occurring, and it saves the cell energy. Only when the cell is needing more does it then start the pathway back up again. So cells have a very nice balance in terms of making what they need when they need it. Make sense? Is this more fun than Henderson Hasselbach or what? OK, good. Most people find it is. All right, other questions before I move on? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it actually, it's a little bit more, I made it kind of simple. But, but you can only have this if you have more than one subunit. Not all multi-subunit uh, enzymes have this property. Most of them don't, but some of them do. The reason we see two different shapes of this curve is it relates to two different binding affinities, just like we saw with hemoglobin. Okay. So we have a very low affinity state down here, in this case, where we have low concentrations of aspartate. The enzyme has to be woken up before it starts to go into a higher binding state. Okay? Remember how in, when we had hemoglobin, when we had one molecule bound and the shape of that first subunit changed? And that interaction with the second subunit changed, so now the second one wanted oxygen even more? Remember that? That was what we call cooperativity. The same thing is happening in this enzyme. The binding of one substrate is affecting one subunit, which in turn causes the other subunits to want to bind more. Okay? And so when that happens, we see a change in the rate because the more it wants to bind, the faster it goes. Make sense? Yes? Inhibits the first enzyme in that pathway. Yes, ma'am. 